Welcome to Lymphoma Myeloma 2018, an international uh, conference on hematologic malignancy. I'm Dr. Morton Coleman, chairman of the conference, and I am happy to have with me today Dr. Ruben Nowitzki, who heads up our myeloma section at Wild Cornell Medicine. He's also the head of the myeloma sessions here at the conference. Ruben, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it was an exciting day today in myeloma. Uh, we learned a lot about precision medicine in myeloma. Would you care to comment on how we're now using precision medicine in the treatment of multiple myeloma? Indeed, we had a very exciting day, uh, and we had the session divided into three uh, sessions, uh, uh, principally three sessions. The first one was on uh, precision medicine, the second was in immuno-oncology, and then the third in, on therapeutics and hope for uh, curing the, the disease. Um, in the precision medicine uh, uh, part, we were fortunate to have excellent speakers, and uh, the, the bottom line is that um, the, the ability to uh, gather the genomic information is now yielding therapeutic benefits, uh, not only from the perspective of uh, prognosis uh, and planning, but also uh, for the treatment selection. Um, examples were given of uh, patients who have multitude uh, or panoply of um, uh, mutations that uh, cannot be har harnessed for treatment, whereas in on other uh, occasions, uh, specific mutations uh, can be found in 5 to 10 percent of the patients, and those mutations can uh, be harnessed to uh, incorporate into treatment not only a single agent for a BRAF mutation, but uh, 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 using a CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, in combination with KRAS or, or BRAF uh, 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 specific drugs to elicit long-term responders in patients who have already refractory disease. Um, the challenge is uh, be, uh, the ability to do it in a generalized way, given that mutations are multiple, the disease is heterogeneous and cannot uh, be, um, uh, and mutations uh, which are actionable cannot be found in all the, pa in all the patients. But from a practical point of view, if you're a clinician uh, practicing in a small town uh, treating a myeloma patient, uh, how real is it to use uh, next generation sequencing? Well, right, right now we are not, not up uh, prime time, but certainly that will, will be part of the future uh, evaluation, not only from the pers diagnostic perspective, but eventually might be even uh, be used for minimal residual disease. Now that's not only uh, um, important uh, from the uh, precision medicine aspect, but uh, remember uh, anaplastic cells, neoplastic cells have the ability to produce neoantigens, and uh, so information gathered from uh, uh, genomics can be also utilized for the uh, recognition of neoantigens that can be uh, um, utilized in the immuno-oncology uh, 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 arena. And since we're talking about precision medicine, where do you see the role of MRD? Uh, first off, is, uh, is an MRD a minimal residual disease, a measurable residual disease, whichever you want to call it, is it in, is it the same if you achieve this with uh, novel therapy versus transplant? And secondarily, how important is it in, turn, in your deciding how to treat and what to treat with? One of the most exciting parts of the, of the meeting in the basic science uh, and uh, translational science part of the, of the meeting was uh, particularly the uh, controversies on uh, minimal residual disease and MRD. And uh, the data is uh, uh, informing us that uh, MRD uh, is an important uh, a parameter um, to be evaluated. It can be predictive of uh, um, outcomes, and uh, it appears that uh, therapy, regardless of what 
kind of therapy it is, if it's with high dose therapy or combination therapy, the important thing is to reach that uh, complete remission with uh, minimal residual disease at the lowest uh, uh, tumor burden possible. But there is still a lot of uh, areas to be developed, like standardization, um, uh, technical uh, uh, wide av availability, uh, and understanding of the techniques uh, of MRD, the timing and um, the information to be used either to uh, evaluate for complete remission, for duration of therapy, for maintenance, for transplant or non-transplant, still many questions to be addressed. But there is some controversy about it. Do you think it's, pri it's already reached prime time for use in the general clinic or in settings other than uh, research studies? Uh, no, we don't have the enough information to be to be this MRD in the standard of care uh, yet, but it will come in the next five to ten years. Now, one of the other subjects that came up, of course, is uh, the use of what we call immuno-oncology, uh, the tendency down to move into the area of immunologic defenses and our treatment uh, of multiple myeloma. Can you give us a little bit, a little vignette of uh, what you heard today in terms of immuno-oncology, both the use of passive and active immunology? Well, there, there was a large session on, on the immuno-oncology, and the first it was expressed that um, in multiple myeloma there has been a long uh, uh, time awaiting for these discoveries because um, uh, prior approaches in the past have been always ne negative or have failed to yield any results. It was not until the advent of the monoclonal antibodies uh, developed against LAM F7 and CD38 that we have seen uh, good results and now we are seeing um, very good uh, outcomes with uh, those antibodies. So we had a good review of uh, the data available for ilotuzumab and daratumumab and then uh, the uh, speakers also uh, touch upon newer um, monoclonal antibodies that are coming against CD38 and, and others. Um, in addition, uh, um, uh, speakers spoke about immunoconjugates um, that are moving uh, into the uh, uh, practice uh, uh, through clinical trials and uh, by functional antibodies uh, uh, as well. So the future is bright in, in, in that perspective, but still uh, uh, early in, in its development. We have to say the monoclonal antibody use is now being part of the therapeutics at every stage of the disease, so I, uh, I don't doubt that the use of those monoclonal antibodies are going to be part of the standard of care within the next three to, to four years. Yeah, that was my question, too. Uh, you know, uh, we have CHOP, uh, rituxan in lymphoma, where the addition of the antibody to the chemotherapy greatly enhanced uh, its therapeutic uh, potency. Do you think we will see the same thing up front? Do you see a time where you'll have an IMID, uh, a proteasome inhibitor, dexamethasone, and uh, one of the monoclonal antibodies all combined up front you using look, some you of our most potent second and third generation IMIDs and proteasome inhibitors? It looks like that. Uh, uh, in fact, in practice, we are combining them now, and now that at least daratumumab is now approved for frontline in patients who are not transplant candidates. So uh, it looks like uh, uh, the RCHOP uh, model is being replicated uh, here. We heard a lot about BCMA, B cell maturation antigen, both as a target for CAR T and both as a, uh, its use at anti BCMA antibody. Uh, would you care to tell us a little bit about BC BCMA, the B cell maturation antigen, and its role as you see it? It's one of the highest expressed antigens and therefore, uh, and it's also very stable. So, although it can be shed, uh, um, it is mo almost exclusively expressed in, in the B cell lineage, in the mature B cell lineage. So, therefore, uh, it, it appears a great uh, target. And in fact, uh, that has been already demonstrated in the different uh, models. Um, uh, the, the, the approaches that are, appear to be more 
uh, advance in the development are the immunoconjugates uh, and, and the CAR-T uh, um, uh, constructs uh, against BCMA. Um, um, and it appears to be an excellent uh, a target for, um, for immuno-oncological uh, uh, use. Well, uh, we just briefly touched upon CAR-T. Uh, where do you see CAR-T's role in the treatment of multiple myeloma? It is certainly an exciting new therapeutic approach to the hematologic malignancies, uh, both lymphomas, chronic lymphatic leukemia, and now it's being brought to multiple myeloma as well. well where do you see CAR-T's role in the future? Well, it is certainly exciting to see uh, a wide variety of constructs being developed, uh, um, not only with one uh, target in mind, but maybe with uh, double or triple targets with more stable uh, 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 systems, uh, perhaps uh, with suicide gene incorporated uh, uh, to be able to uh, manage uh, toxicities. Um, and uh, with the idea that uh, um, uh, it can be uh, redosed, the on data on available only was first on human against uh, uh, BCMA, and uh, it was very promising to have patients who were highly refractory, showing very uh, deep responses and uh, progression-free survival. Uh, uh, superior to whatever was expected in that population of, uh, of uh, uh, patients. Um, some people were uh, disappointed uh, of not seeing a, a plateau suggesting a cure, but I have to caution that that's just the beginning and then I think the uh, better ref refinement of the technology we will be able to reach uh, uh, be better results. Challenges uh, remain uh, the toxicities, which also in a learning curve we think that we can get a better uh, uh, hold of uh, uh, with, with uh, prophylaxis and management with uh, uh, anti-IL-6 therapy. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, trying to figure out where in the treatment schema CAR-T comes vis-a-vis -vis an autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, now, many people advocate using upfront autologous transplant. Others still prefer, if, particularly if their patient achieved MRD with novel agents, to wait for some later date. So you have a patient who had an excellent response uh, to uh, initial therapy, gets MRD, and then comes out of MRD. Where would you send this patient first? Would you send it to an auto trans? Would you send this patient to an auto transplant, or would you send this patient to a CAR T? How do you approach using both of these modalities as of this moment? It may, of course, change in the future. Uh, this, at this time, uh, other factors have to be considered. Um, in your patient that you describe uh, cytogenetic risk. Uh, uh, time for relapse after the induction, time uh, on uh, in remission, uh, comorbidities have to be all considered, um, um, and therefore um, the aggressiveness of the therapy or or the, the treatment selection will depend on all those factors. That being said, uh, at this particular point, uh, CAR T is uh, very limited uh, for patients who have. Um, uh, multiple relapse on high-risk disease. Uh, unfortunately, it's also limited by the availability uh, of the programs that offer it, uh, the protocols available since it's not uh, uh, approved, uh, and the attrition that takes for the manufacturing. So one thing that we didn't talk about uh, in the CAR-T is the availability uh, of using allogeneic CAR-T as off-the-shelf product, or even talking about bifunctionals that can maybe engage T cell uh, in another way uh, that will allow uh, less manufacturing issues. Well, with the advent of CAR-T, what do you see as a role for allogeneic transplant, uh, what we would generally refer to as a mini 
aloe versus a maxi uh, aloe. Do you think many aloe transplants still have a role in the treatment of multiple myeloma? And where would you place it if you do use it in the scheme of things vis-a-vis -vis auto transplant and vis-a-vis -vis CAR T? Well, first of all, autologous transplant has been part of the therapeutics in induction, and that's not going to go away. In our program, uh, if we are able to reach complete remission of MRD negative without it, we harvest stem cells and we will use them upon relapse. And we're focusing a lot on trying to find novel uh, ways of using conditioning regimens to uh, r uh, improve upon the high-dose melphalan uh, uh, standard of care. Uh, how, and that's not going to go away. We can still use autologous transplant not only to salvage, and not only for consolidation like uh, um, it is being used right now, but we often use it as um, salvage mode in patients who are pancytopenic, uh, who require recapitulation of the hematopoiesis, and that will allow to recu recuperate blood counts to later be used for uh, um, availability for phase one or phase two trials. Um, that's the autologous transplant. Now, uh, uh, allogeneic uh, uh, has um, been um, uh, challenging in most of the trials and experiences because of a high level of mortality, 30, 40 percent mortality. But now also that with the technology uh, to prevent uh, uh, CMV infections and uh, other viral infections and uh, to prevent uh, graft resuscitosis, it has de uh, decreased the, the uh, morbidities of the allogeneic uh, uh, programs and therefore um, it is not uh, uh, unheard of uh, that a patient with high risk in first or second relapse uh, being a young patient can be still uh, considered for allogeneic transplant. In fact, uh, we have a handful of patients who have gone through that route, but still is a minority of patients. Now with the CAR-T, um, being the, the data showing such a great efficacy, we will have to wait for it to mature or how do the no, novel generations of CAR-T uh, perform. Perhaps that will be uh, still in place before we choose allogeneic transplant, but I wouldn't discount allotransplant in the future also as another uh, um, technology. Ruben, one of the issues that we brought up is, is um, myeloma potentially curable? Do you think the advent of uh, novel agents plus uh, monoclonal antibody will uh, offer us the possibility of cure? Or do you think we'll have to use other techniques such as CAR-T and allogeneic transplants uh, to uh, produce a cure? Where do you see the potential curability of multiple myeloma based on what you heard today uh, at the conference? Well, historically, there is uh, 10 to 20 percent of patients that can achieve complete remission and remaining complete remission for over 10 to 20 years. Those are the people with and MRD mostly or not? Mostly, now? yes, MRD negative uh, people. Um, but this is da all data before MRD evaluation was wow. even done, just complete remission. So uh, just with the, the autologous transplant as induction, there is going to be a subgroup of patients that are functionally cured. Now, uh, if we can improve upon the MRD, uh, not only the achievement of, but the maintenance of it and the duration of it, I think we can increase that percentage to a 30, 40 percent uh, group of patients. Um, certainly better technology, better treatments, um, um, better sequence of therapies can uh, increase the percentage of that patients and then uh, eliminate those uh, uh, relapses. So I do see a subgroup of patients, perhaps uh, 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 40 to 50 percent that could be uh, ultimately cured. Um, there's still uh, a lot to, to work to do on those patients who do not achieve MRD uh, negativity, those patients who have high risk. Um, uh, and uh, those patients who remain with uh, positive imaging uh, after uh, uh, treatment. So um, uh, there's potential for cure, um, but not, uh, uh, we're not there yet. Now, 
There is also um, the, the potential of trying to approach with aggressive treatments early in the precursor uh, uh, state. MGOS and uh, smoldering. And uh, Dr. Mateos presents uh, her uh, the data. Um, it is intriguing that um, earlier treatment can achieve high response rate, rest chances of mut uh, mutation and heterogeneity, uh, um, and maybe that will be another approach for, to offer the cure. Thank you, Dr. Davitsky, for your observations, uh, Ruben. Uh, we very much enjoyed hearing what you had to say about today's session on myeloma. I am Dr. Morton Coleman, wishing you good day from Lymphoma Myeloma 2018 here in New York City.